exactly is going on. Uh, biopsy would be more um, di uh, diagnostic because you're not sure what we're doing just yet. Okay. Yeah. And then cosmetic improvement. So, how many of you actually got into surgery this semester? <laughs> I don't think anybody is saying you have to do it because of your shift, because of the PM shift. I'm sorry about that. Um, explain to the rest of your class that wasn't able to go, what was your experience like? Awesome. Elaborate. Cold. What was it like there? Cold. Well, it's cold. It's very cold in surgery. Why? Why is it cold in surgery? Bacteria doesn't like cold. It's very dry. It's very cold. Bacteria can't grow. You only, only, you only can only wear one pair of clothes yep. from the hospital. Yep. It was very crowded. Yes, yeah. surgery. Um, surgery suites are ridiculously crowded. But there's like a lot of people in there. Mm -hmm. a lot. And everybody needs to be in there to do the, do the job. Mm -hmm. It's the best the pa best patient ratio you'll ever have in your life. Mm -hmm. One patient to like five people. It's great. <sighs> No, what there else? were like surgical techs in there who were just standing there. They weren't even doing anything on their phone. Yeah. Talking. They're just yeah. very One sterile and clean. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to do anything. One of them was really rude to me, but that was one of them. Surgery staff are rude. Mm -hmm. We're very rude people. Mm -hmm. Doctors were awesome. There's a reason we work in surgery. So you don't keep rude Because we're rude. We're very blunt people. What was the, um, the anesthesiologist, he was like, he's like, I know you're paying for this. He's like, but if you have a question, it's probably not the time to ask. And I was like, okay. Oh, but he, he, he was nice about it, though. And I yeah. was just like, all right. He's like, just write it down. Was he the one with the accent? Mm -hmm. he's, he's pretty cool. He's such a weird person. He, at the beginning of surgery, is not a good time for anybody to be asking questions because there's so much going on. And that's the most dangerous time. Mm -hmm. um, if you mess up at that point in time, you could kill your patient just by putting him under or putting the ET tube in. So that's why there's not a lot of talking at that that time. Um, usually the anesthesiologist and the anesthesia tech and the nurse are the only people up with the patient. Um, the nurse is responsible for the whole room. So we need to be present. Um, I have had nurses walk out of the room at the time of induction and they get in pretty serious trouble. They shouldn't be leaving. Because if something happens, that's their room, that's their patient. They're responsible for it. He wanted me to stand behind him when he was doing it so mm -hmm. he could see it. Yeah. That's the best spot. Cool. At least you could actually see what he was doing. And he like Absolutely. showed me everything. That's the thing cool. I remember is he said this is an insecure airway. He's like, it's not insecure, it's just misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he meant by insecure? He explained it to me. Alright. Alright. So tell me about same day surgery. Oh, that's good in and out. So pre op post op area. So the patient comes in, where the patient recovers. So if you have somebody coming in for the same day surgery, so that they're having something mildly minor done, so they're going home the same day, what are some pre-op teaching you need to do? Breathing. Pain control. Pain control, breathing. So I ask coughing, deep breathing. Diet, or anything special there? Maybe. Any kind of physical therapy going on? Possibly. Where they're going to be discharged to, where their plans are, kind of. Let's, let's keep going down that, that road. Let's drive them home. Thank you. If you have a patient come in and nobody's with them, and you're like, well, how are you getting home? They're like, oh, I'm just driving myself home. Uh, no. no. <gasps> anesthesia, even minor anesthesia, can be in your system for 24 hours later. And people will have periods of days they don't remember after they've gone home. So if they're saying, I'm driving myself home, you're saying, okay, we're canceling the case. They also cannot go home in a taxi or an Uber, okay? Somebody that needs to be trusted to get them home. You guys can read the different suff uh, suffix we use. These are very uh, part of surgery. All right, patient interview. What are some things you would want to be asking the patient in the pre op area? Did you take your medicine for the day? Did you take your medicine for the day? What's that? Drink. Last time you drink. Perfect. What else? Do you know what surgery you're getting? Please, you actually know what you're having done. Thank you. Smoking. You smoke. That, that does affect what we do in the back. It does affect how I we excavate them too. Because of that. Hmm? I mean, I learned to my surgery because of that. Depends what surgery you're having. Some doctors will be like, you're a smoker? Forget it. No way. Spine surgeons, you smoke? Forget it. Really? I was just a breast reduction. Hmm. But they said two weeks you had to go without smoking for. And why is that? Because of the post-op in the hospital. 
You, no. Oh. Because we can give you nicotine patch for that. What? Your healing factors are pretty much gone with nicotine. So spine surgeons, the failure rate for someone that actually smokes is over 90%. So sir, spine surgeons won't even touch them. You can't quit for a couple of weeks while we do this, I'm not touching it. And I've had spine surgeons cancel 10 minutes before we're supposed to take the patient back. What if they lie? We'll find out. <laughs> Anybody care to guess how we find out? There's a lot of work. You can smell it. Put the ET tube in and smell it. The smoke will come out of the lungs. What? You put the ET tube out, smoke will come out. And then we'll turn off the anesthesia, we'll take the ET tube out, and we'll pay the surgery. So surgeons, the surgeon can do it. He can call it. You gotta remember, it's his, it's his practice of license. If something happens to that patient, it's not the patient's fault, it's the surgeon's fault. What if it's emergency surgery? That's totally different. All right, nursing assessment for the preoperative patient. So why would you want to know their psych status? Because of the... Consent? <laughs> and determine afterwards. Determine afterwards? Are they actively taking their medications for whatever mental health reason they have? Are they compliant with that? If they're not compliant with that, they're not going to be compliant with anything they do after surgery. Okay. Determine um, physiological factors for the procedure. What would that be? Is it like a way to take care of themselves? Are they somewhere where they can heal? Are they homeless? No surgery on homeless people. But then it's a whole other ball game about what you're going to do after surgery. How are you going to address the incision? What antibiotics will the doctor put the person on? We always tell you guys, make sure you know what your medica the medications are, right? What other things are we starting to ask patients on? Street drugs. Street drugs? Alcohol. Alcohol? Vitamins. Vitamins. Keep going. What else? Vitamins. Herbs. Herbs. Supplements. Supplements. Keep going. What's really big right now? Pre-workout? No. No, your essentials. The oils. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, I love my oils. I use my oils all the time. I have oils at my desk right now. I had a headache earlier for peppermint. I cry so small. I have had patients putting oil onto their wounds. Um, depending on what kind of oils you get is the purity standard, just like everything else. But um, there's no evidence that putting like thieves oil directly on a wound is going to do anything except burn a lot. Okay, and it will introduce an infection because it's not sterile. Oils, this, these oils aren't sterile. Okay, that's why. We shouldn't be putting them on anything. Now, if you have, I'll put stuff on my skin if there's no breakdown. Like I had a headache or later, so I put some peppermint around my temples and around my neck, but I don't have a massive wound or a surgical <laughs> incision back there, okay? So you, people tend to like jump on a new bandwagon and really run with it. And I have had to take people back to surgery to irrigate wounds from them putting thieves oil in their wound. You'd have thought a couple times of it just painfully burning would have, you know, Something registered right. with them. But no, no, it did not. Uh, all right. Culture. What kind of cultures? Jehovah's Witness. Blood transfusion. Mm-hmm. What else? Muslims, maybe? If they might have to have, like, a female or a male doctor. Or was it it's past, yeah. I is forgot it? what we learned cultural diversity about. I believe so. I haven't run into that as much, probably because we, with being in America, America typically, not, yeah, um, we don't we don't get a lot of really hardcore Muslims or right, Buddhists around here. Um, especially if someone's like, you're gonna die. They don't. So you usually just don't care. I'm like, okay, <laughs> we'll go do this. What other cultural things that you can do? You can absolutely do. We have a very large Hmong population. We have a very large in, uh, Native American population. Bring in a chaplain or a shaman. Or Absolutely. You can bring in their pastoral staff, whatever it is. Because one of the big cultural problems we have isn't that we're not willing to do whatever they want us to do. We don't know. I'll be honest. I am like eighth generation over from Germany. I don't know anything about Germans. There's something about a pickle on a Christmas tree. I have yeah. no idea what they're talking about. What? Find the pickle and you Find get the pickle it. and you get it like a gift. I don't. Yeah, I am. Here's the thing. 
It's not that I would not bend over backwards to do something that anybody wanted, but if I don't understand it or don't know, so I'm not going to be able not, to do it. That's not all Germans. Was they, that? We didn't do that. We're oh. Southern Germans. They don't do that. The okay, Germans. so you know we got the Northern and Southern, so we got we got the Yankees and the yep. South. Okay. And, and it is Texans and everything else. So you're not. No, so I know they got really cool cuckoo clocks over there because yes, we have one. I have one. Yes. So and we're from Frankfurt, and all I know about Frankfurt is there's a very large army base there. So whatever. Um, that's how much I know. Uh, but when it comes to surgery, some, pe some individuals don't want the people bringing stuff back into surgery. Listen, if I have someone that, uh, we had a Native, Native American who wanted to bring their, um, their dream catcher in the back, who cares? Bring them back. Once they're intubated and they're asleep, guess what? I take it back and give it to the, have a tech go out and give it to their family members. And when they wake up, we have the tech go back to the family members, get it, and when they wake up, it's there. It doesn't mean you need to sterilize what's coming back there. Now, if they want to bring something really weird, then they can't bring, like, animals or anything. But we have little kids that come back, and I've had little, you know, zoo stuffed animals surrounding my child on the OR table until they fall asleep. Who cares? That's what's going to keep them calm. That's what we're going to do. And when we put them on the cart, when they're waking up, we put all the little zoo animals back around them like they were there the whole time. Mm -hmm. And, yes, we'll take the, for, um, and we always get the, the, the parents' permission, and we delete it. We'll take one of the digital cameras because little kids, doesn't matter how sleepy they are, if one of those animals was in the spot that he did not put the animal there, you are in trouble. So I have literally went to parents and be like, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going to take a picture. We're just going to make sure the, your child's head's not in the picture, but to make sure the animals are in the right spot. They're fine with that. Because I'm telling you, I woke up, one little kid woke up, and like, well, let's that wolf was not where he left them. I was in so much trouble. Okay. You wanted to give him a kiss. Yes, so. You banished him up. You got it. You just got to make sure. But if you're going to do something like that, make sure you're charging our snows and make sure it's fine with the family, okay? Don't be just taking pictures. <laughs> so anxiety. This is a very anxiety-provoking thing, walking in to have major surgery done, right? So what kind of things you should be asking when anxiety shows up? What's concerning them? Absolutely. Why are you anxious? Is it just unknown stuff, which is completely understandable? Maybe something you can answer and calm the nerves. Is it because, well, Joe from down the street went to the hospital and died. Why did he die? Well, I don't know. Gun won't be or something. For, you know, for all we know, he had stage 5 cancer and went septic and had pneumonia and, you know, died. But because he died in the hospital, that sometimes that's all it takes. They've got to be able to voice their concerns. Pain is something that patients often fear. Very few people in this world enjoy a lot of pain. So when the anesthesiologist calls the patient the day before, a couple days before the surgery, pain is very well covered. What do you want done? What don't you want done? If, what are you allergic to? What have you taken that made you sick? What have you taken that worked? So you do get those couple patients to be like, you know what? I had fentanyl, it worked great. I had morphine, it made me throw up for three hours. We want to know that kind of stuff. My oldest brother, who the one on the SWAT team, both broke, uh, broke both of his hands, not at the same time, but went in for surgery on one and woke up violently ill from the anesthesia. Well, the second time, when he went and broke the other hand, because apparently he needed them to match, um, the anesthesia listened, the anesthesiologist listened to him, figured out what meds he got, changed the meds, he woke up absolutely fine. So there, is, there are different things that we can give to the individual. We're not using the exact same thing all the time. And yes, on his x-rays, he looks like Wolverine. All right. Preoperative teaching. The thing that the patient loses the last and gets back the first during surgery is their sensory. They can touch and they can hear you before anything else. So in the OR room, when the patient is going to sleep, we're very quiet. Or we're supposed to be. When the patient is waking up, we are very quiet. You don't want a bunch of things clanging, a bunch of metal pans being moved back and forth that will make the patient anxious. They have no idea what's going on, even if everything went great. All they hear is something they've never heard before and it makes somebody anxious. Make sense? All right, inpatient. Outpatient, reduce anxiety. If there are family members with the patient, we should do everything we can to keep them with the patient as long as we possibly can. In pre-op, 
We'll let the patient family members sit there as long as possible. It doesn't mean they can bring 12 family members or their closest friends in to hang out. We have, do have limited space, <coughs> but we keep them as long as possible. When it comes to a child, the family member is, the mom or dad or whoever the caregiver is, is there until we are taking the child in the back. And when we're coming out, we get the family member in recovery before the child hits recovery. So the first person the child is seeing is someone that they trust. Because they do not trust us, they don't like us, that's okay. Okay? Uh, Alright. Legal preparation for surgery. Can a patient be an active DNR in surgery? No. Yeah. They yeah. yeah, absolutely can. This changed about 12 years ago. About it used to be if you were going to have surgery, your DNR was revoked for 48 hours after, after your end of surgery. The theory is, if you're having surgery, that means you're fighting. Well, not necessarily. We could be doing a proactive thing. We could be doing a comfort measure thing. We could have somebody that has cancer that's just decided, I don't want to be intubated. I've seen what CPR did to my husband. I don't want any part of it. So yes, we can go in, and if they code, we let them code. It doesn't mean we just let it happen. If we see the blood pressure going down, we can do something to change it. But if all of a sudden they go into asystole or VTAC, VFib, we are technically, by law, not allowed to do anything. We have to let them go. We'll do everything to prevent that from happening, but I've had a couple people on the table throw a PE, and that was it. We let them go. We got them over to the ICU as fast as we possibly could, got the family in there, so technically the heart was still beating, but we let them go. We, we have to respect that. All right, when it comes to the consent itself, patient's full legal name. I don't care what your friends call you, okay? Uh, your legal name on your birth certificate, on your social security card. That is what we have to use. The surgeon's full name, the specific procedure to be performed, the signature of the patient or the legal guardian, a witness and a date. Who witnesses this consent? Nurse. No. Doctor. Doctor. That surgeon better be in that room or that consent is voided. If you have the surgeon go, oh, I forgot to get the next guy to sign the consent, well, I guess you're going out there to do it, Doc. It is not your responsibility. Legally, you can't do it because you are not responsible for what happens on the OR table, the surgeon is. Now, when it comes to the pre specific procedure, a lot of surgeons will put a clause in it that if something else happens or they need to do something else, they'll, they'll add that with later. And typical, typically, patients um, don't particularly care. Because if you go in and like, hey, look, the appendix looks bad, let's just take that out quick. We can legally do that, and we'll just add it later. All right, pre-op checklist. Right. Was your pre-op teaching completed? Was your consent signed? Has the patient been MPO? This is vitally important because I've had people die. Individuals don't think it's a big deal. Well, I ate breakfast. What's the big deal? Uh, I'll wake up. It'll be fine. I have had patients go. I had a patient when I was actually at a work Kenosha um, come in for a seven o'clock procedure. She was having a knee scope done. She went on the way, we found this out later, and stopped at IHOP and had a full breakfast. Mm -hmm. Why I can tell you where she stopped is because nothing had digested yet. And she threw it all up and aspirated twice and coded three times. She, she mm -hmm. almost died. Eight days later, we finally were able to excavate her. It is a big deal. People don't understand. And literally, her family that brought her to the hospital was calling us liars that they didn't stop. We're like, we know she stopped. We know she did. Um, finally, it came out later that her sister felt bad for her and they stopped real quick on the way there. She, her sister almost killed her. So, is the patient in a gown? Listen, you're going back to surgery, you better be naked. The gown's the only thing you have on. I have patients all the time going, I really want to wear my panties. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> They're off, either you're gonna take them off or I'm gonna take them off, but one of us is gonna take them off because I need to get to you. No jury. 
There is still debate out if people can still wear their wedding rings and we'll tape them. There's no evidence that tape does a thing. Does anybody know why we don't want jury on? Hmm? Go ahead, say that. If you have to take them to MRI. Well, maybe if we take them to MRI. But we're hopefully not removing the patient from surgery to take them to MRI. Or something horribly has gone wrong. For those who get lost. Well, you're responsible if it goes missing, something happens. But we use cautery in surgery. Um, so you may know what cautery is? It smells, it smells really bad, right? Oh, we're, we're burning human flesh. What happens if you have a small bleeder, we cauterize it, the bleeding stops. It's an electrical process. What are in your, what's in your jury? Metal. People, can, people have burned their finger. Now, a lot of metals, a lot of the goals, you're not going to have that. You're not going to have that conductability. But it can happen. So we, we really discourage them not to do that. And they do typically have to sign a waiver that they want to leave their wedding ring on. And I feel like the really, really, um, have been married for like 50, 60 years, and they're just not going to take their wedding band off. It's fine. OK? Uh, you know, we'll, we might try to wrap it. We might put some foam between the ring and the finger just to make sure. The majority of the time, it's not a problem, but they always have to be told. The patient should void prior to surgery. Okay, and they should get up and go to the bathroom. Any pre-op meds. What are some pre-op meds that we can use? Benzos. Benzos. What, what's an example of benzos? A lot of men. The helium. Why are you giving people... I don't know. Anti-nausea medication. Antibiotics. 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 Yeah, how about something not so crazy? Maybe some Ativan. Okay. Let's uh, let's not give them too many benzos right now. That's good. That could affect the heart rate. Okay. All right. Side rails up. Correct. All right. Contact lenses out. Please make sure their contact lenses are out. Dentures are out. We typically don't want people to have nail polish on. And I've gotten yelled at after surgery where, you know, women have their nails done and everything and they look beautiful and everything and they come out like half their nail polish is off. Well, because I need to get to your nail bed and I need to be able to see it and I need to be able to put a pulse socks on. I need to be able to take a blood sugar. So we told you to take it off. You didn't want to do it. <laughs> All right. A history of aspirin or any, cl um, any coagulation factors. Antidepressants, steroids are important and NSAIDs. All right, why don't we take five, okay? Let me go check, see what's going on. Oh, thank you. over and runs the show. Uh, I'll be honest, and the people that were in surgery, was Mark and was Dr. Kuzik there when the, the patient first came into the OR suite? No. No, God, no. <laughs> he was oh, he's not there. Five minutes. Ah, he's not there. Uh, none of them are. They're, I don't know where they go. I seriously have no idea. Uh, I think he does laps around the hospital because he's got way too much energy. Um, but that is where the nurse takes over. The techs typically have no reason to be in the room, the surgical facts. Or if there's a nurse scrubbing in, the scrub nurse has no reason to be in the room. The room's ready to roll. As long as nobody's touching the sterile area, we don't need them in there for anything. We want the calmest environment we can have. I don't want my techs going far, because as soon as the patient's uh, ET tube is down and they're secure, we're rolling, we're moving. We're stripping everything off the patient, we're getting the skin prepped up. Um, did he use betadine? The dark stuff? The, with the little yeah. bottles? Actually, the nurse said that. Well, yeah, the nurse says that. Yeah. He ain't doing that. I see him do it once or twice, but not often. And then yep. the, the sheet on. People hide the in most interesting things in their belly button that they have no idea. That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. It really is. So now every time we take a shot, you're going to be like, I have to go to my belly button in case I have to have emergency surgery. I make sure that shit's clean. Yep. I had a skittle just in case. <laughs> but that's because I'm never know when you're going to be angry. It's not yeah. for you, it's for the doctor. Just right. be like, just 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the actual physical environment. An unrestricted area. Unrestricted area, you can go anywhere. Okay? 
That's like the pre-op area. That's anywhere where a family member can go. You're in regular street clothes. That's like the pre-op post-op area. Semi-restricted area is the area that surrounds the OR suite itself. These are for employees only. There are no patients walking around back there. There's definitely no family back there. And then restricted area is the OR suite itself. These are just listing. Typical operation, operating room. Everything might look a little differently, but you got the OR bed. It's a very thin bed. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's very thin. Anybody know why? Hmm? God, I hope not. <laughs> we got to get up close and personal. I'm sticking my hand up to my elbow inside the patient some days. So if like the patient's way over here and you have to do this, it's not going to be cohesive. We're, we're right up to the patient. Like literally, we're typically leaning on the patient just a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Wait, I have one question. So when the anesthesiologist was putting my patient under, mm -hmm. they had to strap up her arms. Why? Yes. Oh, they just dropped. They'll fall. Yeah. Your your body goes completely limp with the anesthesia. They'll they'll fall. And picture a very thin table. I think an OR table is probably thinner <laughs> than these. Doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Your arm falling off. All right. Go and lay in your bed for five minutes and lay your arm down and then try to get it up. Do it. Anybody have any care to figure out what might happen in that time? Blood flow. Okay, you're gonna have a blood flow issue. What's back here? Your nerves. Your nerves. <laughs> you can paralyze someone's arm. It's a big deal. So yeah, we strap them down. If they're up in stirrups, like we're doing a hysterectomy, the patient's up in stirrups, um, I, the, the nurses will constantly be checking because you have those nerve endings everywhere and you have a nerve ending that's pressed down for more than five, ten minutes, you can cause paralysis in a patient. So it is a very big deal. Positioning is a very big deal. Forever? Forever. Forever. Yep. Forever. Sometimes it's temporary, sometimes it will, the, the feeling will never come back. Alright, interoperative patient care team. So obviously you have your uh, circulating nurse. And I was, I was always asked by people when I started in surgery, what do you do? And my response is <laughs> everything. And, and we do everything. We're responsible for the whole room, we're responsible for the patient, we're responsible for the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the tech, and the big scrub. I happen to also scrub. So there are days when shit was hitting the van and they needed an extra scrub person, I'd have another circulator come in and I would scrub in, I'd step in and scrub in. So literally, a circulating nurse needs to know how to do everything. We're ACLS, we're PALS, we're anesthesia certified sometimes. Anybody care to guess why? In case we need to stop it and do it. What if he passes out? What if your anesthesiologist has a seizure and passes out on you? Oh yeah, that happened. It is the responsibility of the nurse to step in. By the way, you call for help for the anesthesiologist, you step in because your patient on the table is in a much dire situation than someone laying on the floor. You can only take care of one patient at a time. You're responsible to take care of the patient on the OR table. Everybody else will come and take care of your anesthesiologist. If you call your charge nurse and say, Dr. Scamacci just had a seizure, he's on the ground, I need help, you're gonna get a whole lot of help really fast. Because one, you have an, you have an emergency situation and two, you need to get him out and get another anesthesiologist in. Because as a nurse, you cannot excubate a patient. I mean, you can, technically. I've had patients do it to themselves, but you're not supposed to, okay? It's not that big of a deal. I love when the restrained ones excubate themselves. Yeah, that's great. Well, I've let people in the ICU do it to themselves. I'll let them do it. Because my theory, with the, with the hospital or intensivist, if they're strong enough to pull that tube out, they're strong enough to breathe on their own. And I've never been wrong. So, so everybody open up the little thing I gave you. This is a Mayo stand cover. They're all expired, so don't worry about it. Can I just share with Anna and not waste it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just open it up. It's not going to be sterilized, so we're just going to throw them away and we're done. 
the bottom of it. It's the weird. Yeah, I, I just do the same thing. So the little stand that the tech or the scrub nurse pushes up to the table that you've all seen in Grey's Anatomy, it's called the Mayo stand. M-A-Y-O. This is the Mayo stand cover. And yes, very, very often we would use it as garbage bag when the, when the piece is done. This is what a sterile field looks like. It's typically always blue. I don't know why it's always blue, but I've never worked at a hospital where it wasn't blue. I've never seen anything where it's not blue. So the very up on top, you have that very, very dark felt stuff. This is your work area. Because once the mail stand cover is on, it's only sterile from your waist, your belly button up. Everything from your belly button down, we don't call it sterile. We, I could say, how can we take it off the mail stand and use it for garbage? I'm using this for wrapping paper. Oh, there you go. See, oh, Rebecca needs wrapping paper. Everybody give her the your out part. Serious. <laughs> 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 this stuff. Like this stuff. She wants this stuff. Okay. It's clean. It's definitely clean. Everything is sealed. So. One of the big things we do in surgery, and this is always like a horror story with people, uh, this is what you hear on the news, that something was left in. We do counts. Counts are a big deal. People don't think they're a big deal. I've had nurses and surgical attacks that be like, oh, what's the big we, All we did was a carpal tunnel release. Really? Because I have a case study where someone left a ray, um, a ray tech sponge in someone's wrist. So it can be done. The surgeon for my 700-pound wife is getting sued in Houston right now for leaving something in. Oh, so that nice little TLC show. Yeah. Mm. Whatever. It happens. Stuff happens. Okay. But that's honestly, as horrible as it sounds, it's not the surgeon's fault. The surgeon will fit the bill. So will the hospital. But it's not the surgeon's fault. It's the nurse's fault. It's, just, it's the circulating nurse's fault. Because we called clear. We said we had everything. I have gotten yelled at by surgeons when I refused to give them their closing sutures because we were missing a sponge. And I had no idea where it is. The surgical deck had no idea where it is. We did a huge abdominal surgery, took a spleen out, we're working on the pancreas, working on the liver. I refused to give Dr. Brown his, his closing sutures. I refused. He was yelling at me. So I don't care. We're missing a lap. I'm not letting you close. The lap was behind the liver. I saved his ass. And ever since that day, I have never had a trial with Dr. Brown. He was tired. It was midnight. We'd been working since 7 in the morning. Oh, yeah. By the <laughs> way, not my longest shift in the OR. It doesn't matter how tired you are. If something, a count is off, you can't close. If you truly, if the surgeon truly doesn't think it's in, in the cavity at all, you can have x-ray come in and we'll, we'll do an x-ray because everything we use in surgery is... Uh, we can we can see it on a radiology scan because things happen, things accidentally get thrown away. But I've gone in after the fact on several different occasions to open people up because someone left a ray tech in a breast, because someone left a closing suture needle in the abdomen cavity. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, no. mm -hmm. It is because as nurses and as medical staff, we're we're still being rushed. We're like, no, you gotta get to the next patient. All right, well, you know, if I've been working for the last 16 hours, I don't have another patient, so let's just, you know, take the extra couple minutes. It is ridiculously important. It's one of the biggest um, medical errors we have, and the other one also happens in surgery, which is wrong site procedure. Mm -hmm. That one blows my mind. Oh my gosh, I'd be so pissed if my right arm was off and it was supposed to be my left arm. <laughs> now you're losing both arms. All right. <laughs> that is like my biggest fear. Yeah. <laughs> but you're gonna be a rich person with no arms. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you I want my arm. Okay, for new ones. I'll get some shorts. One of the biggest um, sites problems, though, is actually um, is actually fixable. It's where we go in and put a stent in a urethra. 
And on the x-ray machine, if you don't flip the image, the left and right will get mixed up. And I'll, I've, had a sur I've had several um, urologists put a stent in the wrong urethra. It's still a pain in the butt. You still have to go in and fix it, but there's, no, there's never been any long-lasting long damage, but still. You have to put the patient under twice, which is never a good thing. All right, basic rules. This is for being staying sterile. When you have your gown on, anything from your neckline up, your face, everything, non-sterile. Your shoulders are non-sterile. So I always cannot stand when I see a show and you have a surgeon walking up behind another surgeon and they tap him on the shoulder. You're not sterile anymore. Go. Shoe. Your back. Your, your back's not sterile. If I have someone that takes, puts their back to the, the sterile field, I'll pull them. Tell them to really go scrub in. Uh, and the axillary, how many have seen people on TV do this? This is very common to see it on TV and movies. You're not sterile. Your armpits are not sterile. We have already talked about this. Uh, we're about to do a knee scope on this guy. Sterile package technique, I'm not really going to show you how to do that. If you ever go into surgery uh, to work, you will get at least a six month orientation. It is, there is a lot of very specific things that come right to surgery. That's why if you go to some place like the ER or the ICU and a surgeon comes in to do something or a bedside procedure, they will bring one of their scrub nurses with because they're not about to train an ICU nurse how to scrub real quick. <coughs> Just a lot easier for us to go with. You can look at your surgical attire. And so when you guys went at Aurora and went to surgery, did they make you wear your footwear? They didn't make me. They did? They did not. They did no, not. They didn't make me. It's not really a big deal. The shoes? The little bit? Yeah, yeah. they yeah. wear that. No, they didn't make me. Did you come across? Depends what yeah. nurse you get. <laughs> What'd you say? I got a sweet. Depends what nurse you get. Lauren. I don't know. I don't know what nurses are. That's the shop I had to turn over. Um, uh, I'd love to show you how to do a five minute scrub, but we don't have the capacity to do that right now. And again, unless you become a scrub nurse, it's not that big of a deal. But I will tell you that anybody that works in surgery for anything, even housekeeping, has to come in in the morning and do a five minute scrub. It's one of the first things we do before we do anything else. We're just scrubbing everything off, especially under your fingernails. That's why as much as I used to love getting my nails done, once I started culturing what was under my nails, oh. I decided to stop doing it. Um, that and, I don't know if anybody heard, this was a good 15, 16 years ago, there was about a half a dozen kids in the NICU that died up down in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. It was because the nurse guy had fa false nails on and had bacteria under the nails and gave it to all the babies, they all died. Six of them died in a week. What? Mm -hmm. When was that? It was like 15, 16 years ago. Oh. It was a while. Like I was just had become a nurse. Latex allergy. How many do you, people you know have a latex allergy or? Apparently everybody. Yeah, right now it seems like everybody. Or a sensitivity. sensitivity. As nurses, typically given enough time, you're going to build up an insensitivity to, to latex. Eventually your skin is just not going to like to deal with that. What are some questions you would ask about someone that said they had a latex allergy? What's What's the the Keep going. Are you allergic to bananas or avocado? There you go. If they say they're allergic to avocados and bananas, they truly have a latex allergy. If they're not, they have a sensitivity. We're still not going to introduce any latex stuff to them, but there is a key difference. Bananas and avocados. I have a sensitivity. Kiwis and strawberries so trigger it too. They can. So contact dermatitis is typically what people get when they have some sort of mild allergy or have a reaction to it. Um, it's very treatable, but you can get anaphylactic shock if you truly have an allergy to latex. If you have a patient that has a true allergy to latex, what is the first thing you need to go do? Latex free. You need to go tell your team, all right, we're latex free. So if they have anything on their field that's latex, the whole field goes away. We break down the entire field and start over. That's why so many times you're seeing in the hospital, pretty much not everything, but almost everything is just latex right now, it's just way easier.
right. Classifications of anesthesia. So the most common type is general anesthesia, right? Put the patient under, put an ET breathing tube down, that is the most general type. If your patient's asking you what type of anesthesia is they're going to get, what do you need to do? Get the anesthesiologist. Get the anesthesiologist. That's their role. That's what they're supposed to do. You have no business saying anything because just because there's a particular order you saw an hour ago, that could have changed. Maybe the anesthesiologist talked to the doctor. Maybe they saw a history that they didn't like. Maybe they went and talked to the family member and decided to change it up. That's when you go get the anesthesiologist. What is local anesthesia? Lidocaine. No. Is it where you just in a known part of the body? That's a regional. Oh. Nerve block? Nerve block? Could be. Local anesthesia is the patient's completely breathing on their own, but they're asleep. So this is a, uh, no, I don't really want to give somebody that's not intubated propofol because like it, it will prevent their breathing. A ton of morphine. Morphine and Ativan. Fentanyl and Ativan, something like that. Something where they can, you can get the whole body relaxed, but the patient still will be able to breathe on their own. Regional anesthesia is what Ms. Teresa is talking about. That is a block that's lidocaine. Uh, regional anesthesia is what you get when you get teeth worked on, typically. All right, you can read the slide on your own. All right, complications. Always exciting complications. Biggest complication of surgery? Death. And everybody that has surgery, anybody that gets any type of regional or general anesthesia will have on the consent risk of death. Because you don't know. You don't know what's gonna happen. Massive blood loss. The most routine procedure can go bad really fast <coughs> if something's going on that you didn't know about or the patient life. Anaphylactic reaction, little more common, but that's why we ask all those questions. Anybody have any idea what malignant hyperthermia is? Hmm? We're going to get into it. It's one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. So, anaphylactic reaction, just like any other anaphylactic reaction. Rapid onset, dyspnea, feeling of apprehension. When I have somebody in surgery or the ER, the ICU, wherever I work, and they said they were just anxious and didn't know why, I was trying to figure out why. Because I've had patients code, and the only pre-existing factor was they were anxious and they felt a pending doom. I hate that. Drives me nuts. So, malignant hyperthermia. Harani started it when she says the patient gets too hot, but there's much more than that. Malignant hyperthermia is a genetic factor. It's not, it is something that you will get from your family. It is caused by certain anesthesias. Succocholine is the biggest anesthesia factor that causes malignant hypothermia. Can you spell it out? <laughs> no, I can't. I'll have to Google it. No. It's up to you. Succocholine. Any of the cholines. Cholines. It's like C H O O L. I'll Google it later and send it to you. I really don't know how to sign. The first sign that there's a problem after the patient gets one of these anesthesias, anesthesia factors, is their jaw gets really rigid. You can't open their jaw. So when I had a gentleman while I was working in Naples, Florida come in, and he had to be intubated, we gave him succicoline, and his jaw got real rigid. Well, being in the ICU, I had never heard of malignant hyperphone before. Never heard of it. Only been a nurse about six years um, and hadn't worked in the, the OR yet. So me and the intensivist gave the patient more succicoline. Finally got the patient intubated and the patient coded and died. When we took his temperature, his temperature was 107. Mm -hmm. He bled out in a matter of minutes. 
So let me tell you what, what goes on in the body. There you go. There, I did put it on the side. There it is. Oh, way off. <laughs> Why can't I even see it? Am I blind? Oh, oh sorry. I did really good, actually. Oh, pretty good. Anybody care to guess what 40 degrees Celsius is in Fahrenheit? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do the math quick. What do you want to know? Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. What is it? Well, I got 118.4. Google says. 48 degrees Celsius is 118.4 Fahrenheit. 40. 40. 40. 40. I thought you said 40. Marty, you said 118. 40. But the patient will go from a normal temperature, 98, 99, whatever, and go up to 104, 105 in a matter of minutes. Um, you've got to get their body temperature down. You have a matter of minutes before they'll be down. The only treatment is called dantrolene and they need a lot of it. This is a code situation, even if the patient has it coded, we will call it code to get help just to mix dantrolene. It can take up to four minutes to mix one vial of dantrolene. Four minutes? Four minutes, too way too much. They're coming up with concentrated solutions so it mixes faster, but the powder is very difficult to mix. If you can get the dantrolene on board before they start to bleed out, the patient needs cooling blankets. They need IV solution with iced water or iced LR or iced whatever you got. You also need to start immediately managing their electrolytes because inside the body, everything's going crazy. Potassium's leaving the cell, sodium's entering the cell. All your electrolytes are just going a little bit ballistic on you. So all this causes you to bleed out. Mm -hmm. Eventually, yeah. Okay. yeah, and eventually, I mean, after a couple of minutes, you don't have you don't have so a whole lot like of time. So it's like all these changes happen intracellularly. It's, yeah, then. because it's so rapid, the body doesn't know what to do. Okay. So then eventually, it just shuts down. Okay. So if you ever have a patient that says, "My relative or whoever had surgery," and they got really, really warm in surgery and had to go to the ICU. This is a huge red flag. The anesthesiologist needs to be told right away, we can completely do surgery, it's completely safe, but we can't use those, those factors. So we have to flush the anesthesia machine out and that takes about an hour to do. So typically, if we know there's some sort of history of malignant hypothermia, it will be the first patient of the day so we can flush the machine out the night before. So technically, couldn't you say that's caused by an allergy to sexicolin? It's much more than an allergy. Okay. Yeah. This, is, this is a genetic sex. factor. We cannot. We can't give any of it. Could you no, give we'll like rock or don't you just? No. Okay. So we we give a quick gas. Just, gas. just gas. We keep. We keep. Yes, Miss Ryan. This might be a dumb question, but okay. So just say there's a cold call. Mm -hmm. Once every all hands that need to be there are there. The sterile field does not matter anymore? It doesn't matter anymore. Okay. Pa your patient's dead if nobody shows up, so sterile field is thrown out the window. The tech will try to keep their sterile field intact because they will have to close the patient if we save them to get to the ICU, um, but that's secondary, and we can open another sterile field, so that's totally fine. Well, if the patient survives, and I say if because the percentage rate I think is like 3%, they go to the ICU, and they typically are put on a dantrine um, regimen for 72 hours because they can have a reoccurrence up to 72 hours after the first one. So we tend to just keep dantrine on board. What's their chances of not having brain damage? Because I can't imagine that they would have it. Just like any other code. So. so you can prevent this if you know ahead of time. Yeah, if you know ahead of time, it's completely preventable. I'm just going to Even if you think it might like happen, <laughs> and there are tests, if you, if a family, um, this is very common up in the Green Bay area, by the way, there's very high genetic rate of malignant hypothermia, so anybody that has a family member that has it gets tested, and there is a genetic code, so 
we, we can know ahead of time if they have it. It is very scary. The, other, the only other patient I've ever had with it well, was a 19-year-old young man that came in for a routine shoulder scope. He had hurt his shoulder and um, he, was dead, he had, was dead 10 minutes after we got to the bar. Oh, it, it's, it's too rapid most of the time. And if you're not picking up on it immediately, <coughs> the patient will, will heat up to a point where they die or they'll bleed out depending on what's happening. When we learned about this in um, Patho, um, David mentioned like some machine, like I want to say echo, but I don't think it's echo, um, that they would put them on to try to help cool them down. Yeah, we could, um, it's a slushy machine. Yeah. So in surgery, if, especially if they're open, we actually can put the slushy machine inside the body cavity and we literally put, ster yeah, it's sterilized, sterilized ice into the body cavity and it'll melt off. So I, I'm sure there's a very high-tech name, but I've always called it the slushy machine. That's what I've always heard it's been called. So, all right, let's talk about post-op, we're almost done. Post-op is immediately after surgery has stopped. So what is your goal of the post-op area? We can identify actual and identify actual problems. And what would be, Examples of an actual or potential patient problem. Breathing, boss. Vitals, hypertension, hypotension. Breathing is a big one, though. Pain. They can't leave the post-op area unless their pain's mildly under control. I say that because, of course, we're not going to fix everything. But if you try to transfer the patient out and their pain's nowhere under control and they're a 10 out of 10, they need to stay in post-op. First of all, you have an anesthesiologist there all the time. So if something's going on, you have someone to write orders for you immediately. You're not calling anybody. Two, if you are the ICU nurse or med surgeon nurse, would you want a patient coming to your floor with 10 ton of pain? No. no, that's just being irresponsible. This is your patient right now. You don't need to push them out that fast. Um, breathing. Breathing's the thing we identify right away. We want to make sure the patient's breathing on their own. What's a normal respiration rate? 12 to 20. 12 to 20? Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. If the patient respiration's a little bit lower, like 10, 11, Nobody's going to get too horribly concerned. We're going to throw them on some O2, keep them talking, keep them breathing, uh, taking some deep breaths. But if it drops under 10, that's when we're going to be trying to wake up the patient, doing a little sternal rub, um, causing some pain to get them to take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. What are some other issues you might see in post-op? Allergic reaction. Possibly allergic reaction. Bleeding. Bleeding. I'm gonna watch those drains, make sure they're not bleeding too much. Typically, the first time you do a drain after surgery, it's gonna be a lot, especially if you're rocking around the patient, the, the body cavities are moving around, they're draining. But you don't want a copious amount of drainage going on, you need to let that surgeon know. And when the patient's still in PACU, the surgeon's still close by. Sur surgeons typically don't leave. They might go talk to the family, but they'll come right back to PACU for the most part. If their patient's stable, they'll move on with their day, they'll go to the next patient, they'll get ready for the next surgery. But most surgeons I have encountered and worked with in my life, if there's anything even remotely going on with the patient, they're hanging out pretty close in PACU. They wanna make sure the patient's okay. Sometimes that's as simple as just giving the patient four or five minutes to, all right, get out of the anesthesia more, start breathing a little bit better, um, start to cough and deep breathe. All right, post-op phases. Right. Post stop one. Care of patient emerging from anesthesia. So this is right off, right out of the OR into PACU. You are one on one. If you are in phase one with your patient, you are one on one. You need to be at the patient side. It is an ICU patient at this point in time. Post stop phase two. The patient's level of consciousness returns to baseline. They're talking to you. Pain airway. So they're breathing on their own. Intact upper airway reflexes. Why do you think lower reflexes aren't applicable? Because they don't want to feel that part yet. Well, what, if they, what if they had a spinal? Oh. They don't have feeling yet, so that's okay. So if they had a spinal, it's not, even, it's not even worth going into. The pain is manageable, which means they're probably still in pain, but they're not in tears, they're not guarding a whole lot, they're doing okay and their pulmonary, cardiac, and renal function is, is back in play. It is very important for any patient that's in PECU 
that before they either get sent home or they get sent to the floor, there must be some urine going on. Okay? They used to call it liquid gold. I don't know if they still do. But those kidneys aren't doing well. Anything you just did in surgery is now null and gay. And then post-op extended observation, the patients resuming are their ADLs. Um, these are the patients that are going home. Post-op phase two, they can go to the floor, they can go to the ICU, they can get out of here. about that. We talked about that. You can read that. You already know that. That's it. Any questions? No. Yeah. Are we leaving at the